who loves watching failed videos or hearing failed stories. I'm Jamel, and I think they're mad funny. And I have some failed stories right here, actually, that I've never heard before. We're going to watch them together right now. All right. This is the first fail story. I was born and raised in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So when I was 13, I went to South Africa to live with my dad and do my middle school there. Oh, middle so school. So I remember my country? first day in school. Imagine, I did not know how to speak English. I did not know the culture. So it was all new to me. And on my first day of sitting in a class, I had no idea what the teacher was saying or had no idea how to talk to the kid next to me. So at the end of that class, all the students left to go to their class. And imagine in Ethiopia, we go we don't go to uh, our, our teacher's class the teacher comes to our class oh, okay. so when all the kids left i was just sitting there <laughs> so the next teacher comes in and tells me what are you doing <laughs> go to the next class i did not know what to do at that time so i was a little embarrassed because i got to that next class very late <laughs> Oh, the worst. The worst. Let me set this up. I have been the Spelling Bee champion for three years in a row. Whoa. Three years in a row, Spelling Bee champ? <laughs> Shout out to all y'all who are good at spelling. All right. Whew. Finally got to my fourth year in the Spelling Bee. Went into it expecting to win. Everyone else was expecting me to win. Mm -hmm. Get up there. Three rounds into the Spelling Bee, I get the word awkward. Oh, no. I get it wrong. I had to fail after <laughs> three years. On Yo, the, word the irony right here. How awkward is it to get out on awkward? Yes. <laughs> oh, the worst. I was in the U13 indoor national championship game for our indoor soccer team. Love me some soccer. And we finished the game tied. So, of course, we're going to go into overtime. Now, it's not a golden goal, which means we have the full amount of overtime. And okay. our coach decides the strategy is he's going to put all of the forwards in the game. Ooh. So that meant I was being put in the game. But he put me in as goalie, but Ooh. I wasn't really a forward. I was not a goalie. This is risky here. Okay. We're in the first half of overtime, and my teammate passes the ball back to me. And I go to trap it, and the ball goes under my feet. No! Into the goal. <laughs> this is... What possibly the most embarrassing way for a goalie to mess up. This is incredible. Into the goal oh. in the indoor national championship game. Oh. I was so embarrassed. <laughs> you still didn't lose though. Oh, okay. Y you failed, but you didn't lose. Okay, I'll give you that. All right, still good fail though. For sure. Even if our failures are embarrassing or painful in the moment, it's usually pretty easy for us to look back on them and laugh. But sometimes we fail in more serious ways. And rather than looking back at those failures and laughing them off, we look back and wonder if anybody, including God, will still love us. The truth is we all mess up, myself included, a lot. And it's part of being an imperfect human in an imperfect world. Maybe there are some choices we keep making over and over again. And even though you know they're the wrong choices, you just keep making them. And that leaves you feeling like a failure. Even though we know we're all going to make mistakes in life, somehow our failures can still leave us feeling like we are the failures. Those mistakes leave us feeling like we've disappointed the most important people in our lives. And sometimes it even feels like we've let God down. When we make not so great choices, it's easy to feel like maybe God doesn't want to be close to us anymore. And I don't know about you, but I don't like that feeling. Even if you're not sure what you think about God, the idea that God might not love you the same way if you fail may have crossed your mind once or twice. And it doesn't sound that great, does it? No matter what the failure may be for you, I think this is true for all of us. We end up regretting it later. We wish that we could take it back. We hope no one ever finds out because if they do, it will change the way that they see us. It's in those moments that guilt kind of starts to creep in. Guilt makes us believe that what we've done or the ways in which we failed mean that no one, including God or other people, could love or accept us. It creates this distance between God and us, and it feels like there's nothing that we can do to fix it. And sometimes that distance feels so huge that we simply give up. We might even believe that God thinks that we're a failure, and that's all that we'll ever be. <sighs> It's kind of heavy, actually. So when we feel this way, what do we do? Well, today we're going to look at a pretty big fail from a guy named Peter. Peter was one of Jesus's 12 disciples. That means that he was part of Jesus's inner circle of friends when he was on earth. Peter got to see and experience miracles that other people didn't. But as we're about to find out, even guys like Peter were capable of some pretty big, massive fails too. 
But before I tell you what that fail was, we're actually going to fast forward a little bit. In the very first Easter, Jesus was put to death on a cross. After Jesus was crucified, he rose from the dead. He literally was dead and then came back to life. Incredible. But what were Peter and the other disciples supposed to do next? They kind of didn't know. So most disciples went back to the work that they'd been doing before they met Jesus. For many of them, including Peter, that meant fishing. That was me casting out. It's what you do when you fish, right? I don't know. On this particular day, Peter and some of the other disciples were out fishing on a boat, and all of a sudden, this guy started shouting directions at them from the shore. He told them to throw their nets on the other side of the boat to catch more fish. So they did. And they caught so many fish, they couldn't even pull the nets back into the boat. And at this point, this just seems like a story about a random guy who knew a lot about fishing, doesn't it? That's probably what the disciples thought at first, until they realized the guy calling from the shore was Jesus. Once they realized it was Jesus calling out to them, the disciples immediately headed back to the shore to reunite with their friend and the leader that they love. And this is where our story picks up. Now, come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? One thing just to let y'all know about is that sometimes Peter was called Peter, sometimes he was called Simon Peter, sometimes just Simon. We see in the New Testament that Jesus went back and forth calling Peter by all these different names. So that's why you'll hear a couple of different ones of them in these verses we read today. Now, in order to understand why Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? We have to go back to Peter's huge fail. You see, when Jesus was on his trial before his death, Peter was asked if he knew and believed who Jesus said he was. Seems like a silly question, right? I mean, as one of the 12 disciples, of course he knew who Jesus was. Of course Peter believed. But instead of telling the truth, Peter answered a different way. Three different times, Peter denied that he knew Jesus because Peter was scared that the crowds would turn on him too. You can probably imagine how guilty Peter felt after that. There's no doubt that Peter felt like he had failed Jesus in a pretty big way. And now we fast forward again to this moment on the beach when Peter saw Jesus again. Jesus asked Peter this simple yet massive question. Do you love me? Let's jump back in and see how Peter responded. Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you, Jesus said then feed my sheep. This is actually an amazing moment. Do you catch why? Remember, a few days before, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Three times Peter was asked if he knew Jesus and all three times Peter denied him. Here, Jesus gave Peter the chance to make that failure right. He did it by asking Peter a question three times in a row. Jesus was giving Peter a second chance. But Jesus didn't just stop there. Each and every time Peter said he loved Jesus, Jesus gave him the same command, take care of my sheep. Jesus wasn't asking Peter to put down the fishing pole and become an actual shepherd, nah. Jesus was asking Peter to take care of other Christians. He was inviting Peter back into the story. And not just that, he was giving him a pretty big role to play up in it. If I were Peter, I would have been expecting Jesus to tell me I couldn't be a disciple anymore after all that. But Jesus had paid for Peter's sin on the cross, every single one of them. And because of what Jesus did at Easter, Peter's story wasn't done. He actually became a leader of the early church. Peter's failures didn't disqualify him from God's love and ours don't either. Isn't that good? I feel like it is. Hopefully you do too. Your failures don't change Jesus's love. Because of Jesus, there is always an opportunity for forgiveness and grace, just like Peter experienced that morning on the beach. Peter may have counted himself out. Maybe you're counting yourself out right now. But Jesus's love never 
counts us out. His love can give us a fresh start because your failures don't change Jesus' love. Now listen, we all fail. We're all going to keep failing for the rest of our lives, unfortunately. But the next time you start to believe that your mistakes make you a failure or that you've gone too far for God's love, I want you to remember Peter. Jesus didn't move away from Peter when he failed. Instead, Jesus moved towards him. And the cool thing is that Jesus will do the same for you, the same for me, the same for all of us. Instead of giving up when you make a mistake, choose to move closer to Jesus. Choose to spend time with him instead of moving away from him. Whatever that step looks like for you, take it. Because remember, your failures don't change Jesus' love. Now, imagine what might happen if you really believe that. I think if we live like we truly believed our failures don't take away Jesus' love for us, we would understand and see God's love is even bigger than we could ever imagine to us, to others, and to the world.